Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our ABCs of Advocacy training. I'm Rachel Monaco. I'm the Manager of Advocacy from Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. Today, our facilitator is Wendy Ho, MPA. She is um, from the, she's the Chief of Staff to Supervisors, Supervisor Otto Lee from Santa Clara County, District 3. I'm going to hand the presentation over to her. Thank you, Rachel, for the kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see all of you here on uh, this great Friday. Give me one second as I toggle between windows to make sure I've got the appropriate uh, slide deck queued up. Um, I hope your week is going well. Um, just wanted to share a little bit about myself before uh, going into today's training. Um, met much of my experience has actually been in the nonprofit sector working on behalf of communities and advocating for pressing community needs. And while now I work for county supervisor, you can't always take that community out of it at heart. So when Rachel and Zia asked me to um, share a little bit about my uh, tips and tricks of the trade for my years as a nonprofit advocate, I said, sure. Um, but now you've got the added benefit of me actually now um, working for an elected official and, 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 and kind of giving you a vantage point of what uh, I find now that I'm on the other side of the advocacy table uh, uh, in terms of what is effective. And so hopefully over the course of our time this afternoon, um, you'll be able to uh, pick up a tip or two on how to really um, be an impactful advocate. All right, so next, so just a little bit of our roadmap for this afternoon. I'll talk a little bit on the front end here about why it's important to advocate. I'll share some of my best practices for maximizing visits with policymakers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the nuances in working with the state government versus local government. Um, I'll share a couple of resources as well, and then other thoughts on how you can continue these conversations you're having with policymakers when you're doing these advocacy visits outside of those visits. And really, um, as Rachel noted, kind of at the end, the tail end, we'll have some time for questions, but we're, we're really, I'm all about making sure that we have time to practice and, and apply what we learn. And so we will be breaking out into some breakout rooms to, uh, to practice what we are, are learning together this afternoon. All right, so let me do a little bit of level setting here. Um, I am a big fan of the annotation uh, tool. If you're not familiar with it, uh, there is on the top of the Zoom screen, there's a little, um, a little uh, pull down menu where you can actually choose annotate. And I think it actually, it's also on your control panel. Um, and so instead of a traditional pool, what I'll put up on the next screen is actually a little bit of a little bit of an icebreaker to understand why our people are here this afternoon for this training. So as I mentioned, at the top of the screen, you'll see a green bar and a view options drop down menu. You're going to select annotate and a toolbar will come up. You can pick a stamp or you know a, a little line drawing thing um, to be able to mark what uh, brings you to this session this afternoon. And so let's give it a try. Hopefully folks are willing to, to mark this up. So again, you're gonna pull, you're gonna hit select annotate, and then you're going to pick uh, a stamp as to why uh, you are here this afternoon. And it looks like we have a few, uh, my boss made me do it, uh, which is about as good as any. Uh, I've got a number of folks who are new uh, to advocacy and want to learn how to, to improve, want to, and we've got a couple of folks who are here to improve their advocacy skills. And, oh yeah, okay, so we've got a, a fair smattering of folks. Perfect. Thank you for indulging me. And if I can get Rachel or one of the other co-hosts to go ahead and clear the screen so that when I get to the next slide, we don't have the beautiful artistic drawings uh, on that slide. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, uh, you know, again, my background isn't actually working with nonprofits on, in, in, in terms of in engaging in, in advocacy. So uh, while this slide may look a little um, be tailored to nonprofits, it's absolutely tailored for folks um, about why we should be advocates in general. Um, 
so in a previous life, I worked for a trade association for nonprofits, the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. And so uh, for many of us that have worked in the nonprofit sector or are working, and, and I think many of you are actually um, working in, in a school district setting, you know, a lot of the, the reason why we get involved with this work is because we want to improve community conditions, right? We're here to achieve missions to, you know, you know either educate, our community to provide relief and support services to our community. And I've always been of the mind that advocacy is just another way to advance that personal mission of your organization or your own personal mission that you have in service to community. So I want to take just a second and, and think and pose this question, um, particularly for those of you that are uh, working in the nonprofit sector. Is there a nonprofit mission that could not be enhanced with some advocacy? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Just think about, you know, you know, the the, the for example, the the mission of, of Second Harvest, right? It, how, you know, and and their goals around um, ending hunger. Like, wouldn't that be helped by advocacy? Just so, just think about it. So, it's a rare nonprofit mission that couldn't be helped uh, with advocacy. Um, and I think, you know, part of it's, many of you have. Uh, indicated that you, you wanted to attend the session to learn more about advocacy. And I couldn't be more heartened to, to hear that because who else will be able to respond to a lot of the community issues and community debates that are happening? Um, you know, business and government might, um, but think about the, the, the folks in community that, that you are working with at the school district level or, at, or in your individual nonprofits, who's going to be advocating for them? Um, and I think, again, as we think about why we enter uh, these, these type of jobs or uh, at volunteer activities, it's because we are motivated by a deeper personal or, or professional mission. Um, and I think, you know, for many of us that are working in community and, and working with um, communities that, pick your, or that are particularly overlooked by other systems, I, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to be able to elevate their voices. Um, you know, so much of the work that we do in communities about alleviating symptoms, right? Providing food to those who are hungry, medical care for those who do not have health insurance, after school programs to divert kids from unsavory activities. Um, and, you know, for me, I think advocacy is a great tool to move beyond some of those band aid solutions and really get to some of those uh, addressing the root causes that are responsible for a lot of the situations that many of us are working to alleviate. And so um, I would say, I think, you know, advocacy is coming, becoming more and more a uh, recognizable tool for folks to help ad advance uh, those personal um, causes. And so just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, why you, we all should be involved in advocacy. Um, I will talk, I could talk all afternoon about that, but I, I want to get on to some of the, the good stuff here. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how you can maximize your impact when you're doing those advocacy visits with policymakers. So when we think about advocacy, we tend to think about meeting, you know, a legislator at City Hall or in the state legislature or in my new role as um, a staff member for County Supervisor Otto Lee, you, you think of, you know, these stale office buildings uh, and, you know, not really great for engagement. So in this next segment, I'm going to share a little bit about some of my tried and true tips for maximizing these, these types of meetings. And again, if you have questions, we will have time at the end to um, address them, but go ahead and put them into the chat and you know, Rachel will make note of them uh, as we go along. All right, okay. So improving your e effectiveness. Um, I think you know, really I, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my years of doing advocacy is really investing in relationships because you'll never know when um, it, you, you may utilize that, that and leverage that relationship. Um, you know, I, I think you have to think of advocacy as, as a longer term um, relationship. It's not just a one and done type of thing um, because it's important to build that relationship with a policymaker, just as you, if again, if you're in the nonprofit sector, as you would, as you would cultivate a, a new donor, right? You know, you can't just make that ask from the get go in that first meeting, you need to kind of warm up to that. Um, in the same way you wouldn't ask a donor for a, a donation right off the bat, you want to learn a little bit about what makes the, the donor tick, 
Uh, and, and so you really want to be able to understand where they're coming from and build some of their relationship, build a little bit, bit, bit of that familiarity before uh, pursuing an, an ask. And again, it's an ongoing thing. Um, you know, there are a number of organizations that do fundraising events or meet and greets um, where you can, where they'll, where they'll be hosting policymakers. And that is a great way to start building a relationship with those policymakers if you don't already have one. Um, and if you don't have, uh, you know, an in, you can always just, uh, you know, request a meet and greet with the policymaker. So just, just know that we have to start somewhere. And it pays to uh, really invest in those relationships, cultivate. Again, it's not a one and done. You want to be able to be a, a presence in this policymaker's life. Um, I think site visits are a great way uh, for, uh, for you to build some of those relationships with elected officials. I don't know about you. Um, my boss, not so much, but other elected officials certainly love having their photo taken and posting that on social media, especially when they're doing things, uh, they're taking those action shots, right? And so, you know, you'll see as Tracy and the folks will tell you at Second Harvest, you know, how many times they'll have an elected official come visit the, uh, the food bank and they'll be sorting produce or whatnot and they'll have this big smiling grin on their face um, policymakers love any opportunity to uh, be in community, have a picture taken, have that photo moment, and, and show that they're doing good in community. All right, so that's just another way you can start building some of those relationships. The next box here, educate before you advocate. You got to do your homework. Before meeting with a policymaker, at a minimum, at a minimum, please read their bio. Uh, if you know, just to understand what professional experience they they may have had before coming to elected office, um, learn what committees they are on. Right. Um, for example, my boss serves on the uh, county board of supervisors uh, health and hospital committee, and, and also the finance and government operations committee. And so there may be issues that. Uh, that you all care about that may be under the jurisdiction of the committee that your, your policymaker is on. You may also want to do a little bit of digging and, and understand what issues are important to them. You know, many of our policymakers have kind of their big priority issues listed on their website. Um, and they, you can read a little bit about kind of what, what interests them, you know, what segments of that work are are critical to them and how what other things that they might be um, interested in and you know the kind of the press release section of the uh, policymaker website is also very rich with that information. Um, also to kind of build that situational awareness it, it's also good if you just kind of do a quick review of um, you know the local newspapers or newspapers to see kind of how um, you, the target policymaker has been showing up in the news, right? Um, you know, uh, for those of us that are, are in the local advocacy space, San Jose Spotlight, the Mercury News, San Jose Inside, they offer decent recaps of some of the recent happenings of what's going on in local government. The Sacramento Bee does a pretty good job of covering things that are happening in our state capital. And obviously uh, periodicals like the Washington Post and New York Times are covering more, more federal issues. And so, um, you know, you just want to kind of understand what the context that you're walking into. Uh, the next suggestion I have is to, to, to really position at yourself as a resource, right? It's, it's really important to be both a problem solver and advocate for your cause. You are the expert on the issues, right? Not necessarily the policymaker, although the policymaker also thinks that they may be the expert on all the issues. And I I will respectfully disagree, <laughs> but you're the ones who are working in community on the ground, talking with families who are, are looking to, uh, you know, work on child nutrition issues. Um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to leverage that expertise and position yourself as a resource to the policymaker. So when I, you know, for example, if I, there are a number of issues that will come before the Board of Supervisors. And if it's, you know, an issue related to, um, food access or um, kind of nutrition standards, you know, of course, I'm always going to think about, um, you know, Second Harvest, but what are some other groups that we can, um, that, like yourself, like some of the groups that you're affiliated with that can position yourself as a resource to a policymaker? And again, it's about building that longer term relationship 
so that you can, you know, be top of mind for those uh, policymakers when they have an issue of uh, relevance uh, that comes before them. You want to be the, one of the first calls that they make saying, hey, I really want to pick your brain on this issue. The, the flip side of this is, you know, I think in my years of being an advocate, and certainly in my years of not only being, um, uh, you know, having worked for an elected official, um, so in addition to Supervisor Lee, many, many moons ago, I worked for a former congressman, Mike Honda, and my, one of my biggest pet peeves as someone who would have to take a lot of these these advocacy meetings is that, you know, people would come, groups would come in and they would just complain about issues, but offer no solutions, right? Again, if you're going to position yourself as the content expert, you also need to help us come up with solutions. And while the policymaker has some ideas about what, how uh, situations can be alleviated or what solutions could be on the table, who better to offer those solutions than the people that are actively working on these issues day in and day out. So again, that's another way you can position yourself as a resource. All right. The other thing, one of the other big things that um, my biggest pet peeves is, uh, you know, you, you've got uh, folks, got a big group of folks, and everyone that is in that meeting should have a role. And, and so Rachel and, and Zia will laugh at this because we had a pre-meeting um, in preparation for this. I said, said to them, don't be a garnish. Right, don't be there to look pretty or to cheer people on. Everyone should have a role in the meeting, right? So either you're gonna lead and you facilitate the meeting, you follow uh, and you offer uh, supporting facts or you get out of the way uh, because, you know, having worked in different levels of government as well, uh, when we weren't in COVID times and we weren't doing virtual meetings, but it, office spaces can be quite small depending what level of government you're at. And so, um, you know, if you've got a big group and, you know, they're not, not everyone in the group is, has a speaking role, then you, maybe you need to think about um, the efficacy of that. So that's just my own personal opinion, but uh, I implore you, please don't be a garnish um, because yeah, that, that for me, that doesn't serve anyone. <laughs> So, All right. Wendy, um, I'm, yes. I'm very interested in that because um, certainly we are part of other advocacy groups that do seem to feel that bringing a group at least shows support, even if, you know, because you often in these meetings, what, we get 10, 15 minutes with you all, right? Right. So, you know, you can make it a very narrow group that each get to speak, or you can bring a broader group to show, yeah, these folks are all in support too, but you think that's a bad idea? I mean, I think it's a, it's very context sensitive, Tracy. Um, you know, for example, if there is you know big, there is some strength in numbers, but you can demonstrate that strength in numbers in other ways, right? So whether it's petitions or a call or a Twitter storm campaign, right? There are other ways beyond showing up on mass in person, especially in during COVID times. I think a lot of off, a lot of elected offices are actually moving away from the big big tent like let's have everyone pack the, the chambers type of meetings, right? So I, I think that's I also was very assuming common. Zoom, yeah. but you're right. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll be back in person. <laughs> correct, correct. So, I mean, I think there is a time and place for those tactics, but um, you know, I think there are other ways to demonstrate those, that strength in numbers, but excellent question. All right, a uh, couple other uh, tips for improving your effectiveness, you know, obviously, you are the content experts, but it's always better to engage uh, the policymaker in a dialogue and just kind of, kind of, uh, instead of rattling their ear off and being a talking head. Um, instead of saying, for example, you need to fix X, uh, maybe try something softer, like how can we partner on this effort, right? It's all about framing and presentation. And again, um, you know, you, you don't want to turn a policymaker off be, because, you know, uh, of the tone and the approach that you're taking. Um, so when I say ask rather than tell, policymakers also don't like it when you tell them to do things as if you are, you know, uh, you know, you're criticizing them. Again, it's like, how can we work together to improve, um, you know, this particular situation that you are talking to them about? Um, I think, again, along the same lines, don't whine, um, you know, because when you start complaining, that's one great way to turn a, a, a policymaker off. And again, um, you know, being able to offer solutions to a lot of the issues that you're raising is going to make you uh, more useful to a policymaker in the long run. Um, flip side of all of this, too, is listening is also communication. Again, we should be in dialogue 
and it should be a two-way street. And so, and, and you know, unfortunately, as, as people will tell you, sadly, some there are some policymakers who like to hear themselves talk and will dominate meetings. But again, the goal is to try to engage in dialogue. And again, um, you know, once a policymaker and you've uh, has established a relationship with you, they are more likely to engage you in dia dialogue, right, and build that relationship. Um, I think it's also important, um, and I reflect on my time as. Uh, staff member for elected officials to speak with your heart and your head you have to really humanize the issue um, we have to recognize that policymakers hear from professional lobbyists all the time and for me the meetings that have resonated the most and that have been the most impactful are the ones where we have you know um, parents or um, you know we're speaking from the heart on issues right um, and, and, you know, and this is feedback I've heard from other folks that have worked for elected officials that, you know, they appreciate those stories because it really puts a human face on the issues that you are trying to advocate for. Um, and so anything you can do to kind of speak with conviction um, to kind of, you know, tell that heart story is what is going to be more memorable than the zillion uh, bits of uh, data that you may share, which is also important, but, uh, you know, for me, what stands out of the day, I will always remember, you know, the, those folks that are brought to tears because of particular issue um, that they're, they care about. That's what's going to resonate. Um, and of course, I think the last tip I have for you here is be patient. Timing is everything. Um, and as folks will tell you, government often moves at the, the pace of molasses, like it is painfully slow how, how, how quick or not quick uh, government moves. And so, um, you know, you just, it's again, it's not a one and done. And that's why we have to have build, be in relationship with these policymakers because change sometimes more often than not is incremental. And so you, you kind of have to kind of chip away at it um, until you, you get to that larger policy goal. Um, and again, you know, maintaining those relationships, being in communications with um, elected offices, again, it's, um, you know, one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, really build that relationship. So now, now that I've kind of uh, shared some of those uh, tips and tricks, I want everyone to take the same annotation tool and go ahead and pick out the tips that resonated with you or things that you're like, huh, I never thought about it that way. So I'll give folks a minute. Wendy, while we have a pause, we just had a, two questions in the yeah. chat. Um, one, Bridget was wondering about Zoom. So can you be a wallflower on like a Zoom, big Zoom call um, rather than being in person? Uh, yes, uh, you can be a wallflower. It's a little bit easier to do that, right? Um, I think uh, video meetings have really uh, improved engagement. Um, and, and so, yes, I think it, that that is fine. But again, you know, uh, if the goal is to build relationships with individuals, how can you build a relationship if you're just a wallflower? So just some food for thought there. All right. Thank you. So we're seeing some annotations going. All right. Speaking with your heart and, and your head. Okay. To humanize the issue, ask rather than tell. Listening. Great. Thanks, everyone for your input. And Rachel, can I have you clear the screen again, please? Perfect. Beautiful. Just like magic. Okay. All right. So um, now I want to go into just some, some thoughts on developing your, your personal message. Again, we're going to, uh, you know, uh, lead with our heart. You know, how do we build a compelling personal message? Um, that will ultimately resonate with a policymaker. And so, um, you know, these are a couple of prompts and um, we, we'll, we can send uh, this to folks after the training, um, but I wanted to review them just briefly. So uh, these prompts can help you develop your per personal message. You know, what are the issues that you care about? Why do you care about it? Why does it resonate with you? How does it impact the communities that you serve, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, policymakers are also moving toward uh, a place where they're thinking about, hey, you know, what does the data tell me? I want to be a data-informed policymaker. So, what data is out there to support your uh, your your claims? 
Um, and again, if you're going to be uh, a resource, you know, it, not only is it framing the, the issue, but it's also what are possible solutions to, to meeting that challenge. And so I uh, just want, these are just some things to help frame um, your personal message. And we'll, um, when we're, we're in small groups, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive on that. Okay. So for, and so for those of you, it seems like a number of folks on the call, um, you know, they are new to this space. And so let me break down a little bit about uh, what a typical meeting with a policymaker looks like. You know, once you've got that perfect message developed, here's how to put it into action. So again, you know, everyone should have a role in the meeting. And typically this is based on, I mean, then this is true for in-person meetings as well as virtual meetings. Um, you want to take a few minutes to introduce this, the staff or, uh, the, or, or the legislator. Um, you want to thank them for taking the meeting. You want to share a little bit about who the group is, um, um, who your members are, and why, and the purpose of your, your meeting today. And basically doing that, uh, that high-level introduction of um, the summary of kind of why you're here today today and to share any high level data um, that is available. And policymakers love it if you can provide data that is specific to their district or jurisdiction, right? So for me, I'm gonna want to see data that is uh, very specific to Santa Clara County Supervisorial District 3, impacting the cities of Sunnyvale, Milpitas, Albiso, and North San Jose. So anything you can do to localize that data, even to zip codes, that's gonna be very compelling because they're gonna be like, ooh, um, that's really good to know. Um, you're going to have to make a pitch as to why the, uh, this issue should be of importance to uh, your policymaker target. Again, you think, try to think about a personal story um, about how the issue has affected someone in the group who is speaking, their family, or you know, could be based on the research that you've done ahead of time, how it's maybe impacted someone in the legislator's district or in um, their network, right? And then um, basically you wanna end the meeting with um, the ask that you want to make of the le legislator. Maybe you ask them to attend an event uh, it, 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 that your, your organization is hosting in their district or request them another meeting, um, perhaps in the district office, uh, if you're meeting with someone that is uh, you know, working at the state level or federal level. Um, some people have asked like, well, you know, given how, how impacted policymaker schedules are, should we get the ask out uh, at the top of the meeting? And I would say, uh, depending on your comfort level and the familiarity of the policymaker on the issue, um, it may be advantageous, uh, particularly uh, uh, higher levels of government where uh, meetings tend to be a little bit more, um, a little shorter, uh, particularly at the congressional and, and state uh, legislature level. I know meetings can run, you know, you may schedule a 15, or you may schedule a 30 minute meeting, but you've got 15, right? So um, again, depending on the level of familiarity of the policymaker on this issue, you can make the ask up front in the off chance that you know they have to end the meeting early. So I've seen it both ways, but again, I think it just really, you have to gauge uh, the particular policy target's knowledge of uh, an issue. All right, a couple of do's and don'ts, uh, and then we'll, we'll take a brief pause. All right, so here are some of the do's and don'ts I've learned over the years. Some of these are very common sense based uh, some of them, I think, uh, are a little bit more nuanced. All right, so, so here are a few do's and don'ts. Um, I think it's important to realize that you won't always be able to meet with the legislators themselves. I think that for, for particularly folks that are new to advocacy, they always expect to meet with the policymaker. And more often than not, um, uh, as, and this is even true for local government, you're often going to have to meet with, with staff. Um, and don't be miffed by that. Um, and, and, and in fact, I would argue that staff who are the ones who are doing most of the background work to prepare uh, the, uh, the policymaker on these issues. So, you know, don't, don't be surprised if you are meeting with a staff member. Um, staff are there who are, are gonna be there to be the ones who are making sure that the policymaker has, is briefed on these issues and they um, meet 
and they can be a great conduit information. So don't discount staff. I think that's one of the things that you, you want to be mindful of. Um, you know, as I, I was, as I was kind of referencing earlier, depending what level of government you're at um, and what time of year you're, you're, you're doing your advocacy visit, don't be surprised if you are meeting um, a staff member or a legislator uh, in a hallway or in a, and I, I've, I've taken, and when I worked for Congressman Honda, I, there was a broom closet that I had once had to use for a meeting just because office space was a, a high premium. So again, you know, uh, depending on the level of government, you may or may not have a, a comfortable conference room space. So um, again, in the age of social distancing, I think, you know, the Zoom meetings have been um, a little bit easier for facilitating some of those conversations. Um, uh, but yeah, it may be, you may very well have to take a, an, a, a meeting in the hallway with other groups shutting them out. So don't be surprised by that, okay? All right, a couple more tips. Um, and while it may be tempting to talk about all the things that your organization does or all the things that you do in community, it's, it's best to prioritize one to three things. You know, I think, again, if you're looking at how to be impactful, while we may have a laundry list of issues that we want to talk with the, the policymaker about, you know, to really to maximize that, that efficacy, probably one to three things tops. Because um, we have to remember staff and policymakers are in a zillion meetings a day. And I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in this week. And could I tell you all the different topics that uh, folks talk to me about? No, right? <laughs> um, so you'd be lucky if you, you had one or two of those topics stick. So again, if you're thinking about maximizing your input, try to minimize the things that you are referencing in the meeting. Um, one other tip I always like to do, to offer, is to take a picture with the legislator. Um, you know, in the olden days, right, it was, uh, you, I would send these pictures to the uh, elected official's office and with a thank you note, with a handwritten thank you note. Again, to build that relationship, to be a little bit more memorable. Um, and it's a great way you can continue the conversation with an office after you visit with them. Um, that is one of the things that I think has been very much appreciated. And, and you know, that's something I definitely heard from, from the legislators I would visit with. They, you know, I would see the picture from the last year's advocacy visit, or I would see it in, in their newsletter. Um, and so again, it's just one um, thought on how to continue building and strengthening that relationship with a policymaker. And I think, of course, at the end of the day, you want to have fun, right? Like, it, I think it's, it's very easy for people, especially newer advocates, to get in their heads about this. Um, you know, they have to, you know, you know stick to their talking points. Um, but, you know, we're all human. Um, and particularly during COVID, you know, things you know, go a little bit of a skew and you forget things, um, just remember to have fun while you're, 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 you're doing this because, you know, this is, this is part of the work that we do. So, all right. So I'll pause there. And I know, I don't know if there are any burning questions from the chat that we want to take on now, Rachel. Um, two quick want. meeting <laughs> logistics questions. Mm -hmm. um, one, do you prefer to have a detailed agenda before the meetings? Um, and two, what is your more the typical preferred meeting length of time? Ah, okay, so I would say um, it does help to have um, a, a, an agenda. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but if it's just a list of topics or things um, that will help uh, the staff um, prepare the, the policymaker or prepare the staff member so they can get in the right mindset. So that is very much appreciated. Um, it doesn't have to be super detailed. If it's just like three bullets on like, here are the topics we wanna to talk about, that will help frame the conversation. In terms of desired um, meeting length, I think, um, and I can't speak for other, um, other elected officials, but I think for, uh, for our office, we like 30 minute meetings. Um, usually not more, uh, depend, but it just depends on the complexity of the issue. So again, if we're trying to build a relationship. It's probably better to have multiple 30 minute meetings than one, you know, one hour meeting, right? So just think about how you are um, impacting 
um, the, the schedules of these very busy policymakers and their staffs. So great questions. Thank we'll keep you, it. Wendy. Of course. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna let a Amy off mute to ask her question. She's okay. been holding it for a while. So okay, perfect. Okay, until she, uh, I'll just uh, go ahead and ask it. I don't know if I quite answer it, but she is at, or understand it. Do you, don't you do the research before targeting a specific policymaker? Uh, yes, I mean, you, again, going back to educate before advocating, yes, you want to do, you want to do some research beforehand, but you, you, particularly if you're asking them to vote on a certain issue, you may not know how they're going to vote. Um, and, and so just familiarizing yourself with their voting record or kind of their positions on issues may inform that. Um, and you want to be prepared because, you know, more often than not, the policymaker will have questions um, about the particular issue. And you, and you want to show, again, that you are um, a resource, that you can be a content expert for them to, to call on. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I'm seeing very use of facial. Can I ask a kind of very big question? Because it tails back to your original um slide about you know advocacy root cause versus you know band-aids and i know there are a number of people on this call that are very interested in root cause and as a food bank we're kind of having a conversation actually there's kind of a nationwide conversation among food banks about root cause versus you know just uh, advocating for food mm -hmm. and um of course first off defining root cause is one of those challenges right you know sure racism poverty there are solutions ranging from you know housing to child care to um, a number of things as you know from being in our meetings we're usually spending our entire meeting trying to make sure we're talking about you know improvements to calfresh school meals supportive food banks food rescue how how are electeds thinking about root cause and how how much uh, leeway do organizations like ours have to either get more time or to shift the conversation or to build credibility to say, therefore, um, you know, we need universal basic income or the child tax credit. You know, how does how do we start to process how to think about those things and how to be effective? Sure. Great question, Tracy. That's a very, very big question. I would say, um, you know, it really depends on the policymaker because some, you know, have, you know, have been steeped in community work and they understand, you know, some of these root causes and others, um, you know, may have come from uh, positions of privilege and, you know, are just learning about these issues uh, for the very first time. I, I would hope not, but, um, you know, they, I, I will, you know, just say, I think all of us are in different places in our own kind of equity journeys. Uh, and we have to respect that and we have to try to meet people where they are. Um, and so tailoring messages based on kind of, again, you know, doing some of that research up front about, you know, stances that a policymaker has taken on, you know, some provocative issues, reading up on, you know, how they've been portrayed in the media around certain issues, I think is, is important and can help inform whether or not you can have that conversation about like, you know, uh, systems of oppression, for example, right? Uh, you know, you might be able to have that conversation with, you know, someone that had, you know, who has a background in kind of the social justice space, you know, worked in, um, you know, kind of uh, that arena, but maybe someone who uh, is an engineer by training, like, uh, you know, like some folks are, uh, like, for example, U.S. Senator uh, Alex Padilla, he was, a, he was an engineer, before he was a policymaker. And so it was only through some, some policy issues that impacted him very personally that he got involved in, 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 in politics. But did he have that orientation um, from the beginning? Maybe through lived experience, but um, I'd say it just really depends. And to, to answer your second question about you know organizations like Second Harvest, can they add credibility? And I think it's very easy for us to assume certain organizations will always, you know, advocate for certain issues. But when you're hearing that the food bank is, is talking about uh, broader issues like a universal basic income, you know, we wouldn't necessarily uh, make that association, you know, known. And, you know, having different voices that 
are non-traditional is going to um, pique the interest, I think, of a lot of policymakers. So I think there is some value add as we look at these root causes. And it's really, and you should be able to articulate why uh, you or your organization cares about these root causes because, you know, is it, bec you know, because of the work that you do? Is it, you know, is it the lived experience that you're, you're seeing with some of the clients that you're helping? Um, and I think having some of those non-traditional um, partnerships is, is very compelling. So hopefully that answers your question, Tracy, but it's a very big question. <laughs> a very big question, right? And if I looked at your other tips, would it have to be kind of centering on one or two solutions you're talking about not solving the panoply of you know potential things right again because we know government moves at the pace of molasses so like so what are some those incremental things that we can work on to help alleviate some of those immediate conditions knowing that a band-aid is not enough but how are we chipping away at some of those systemic issues right so just some some things to think about okay i uh, i know we're running a little bit short on time so i'll, I'll run through um some of these other tips so um, obviously, uh, you know, advocacy visits are great, but you know, what else can you do to think about how you can build relationships with, with policymakers? So you've done, you know, your advocacy visits. Now what? Essentially, is the, the framing of this next uh, segment. All right. So uh, there are still plenty of ways to advocate beyond meeting uh, a policymaker in a large, uh, an advocacy visit. Um, you know, one thing that I've always encouraged nonprofits to do is to host different events or um, that the policymaker, um, uh, you can expose a policymaker to. Again, you know, you can do a meet and greet with your, your organization or your school district. Um, a number of nonprofits uh, as well have been holding um, forums. Um, you know, Sacred Heart does that very, very well. Um, again, site visits, um, a photo opportunity is gold for policymakers. So anything you can um, manage for that would be terrific. Uh, you can also work in coalition. And I know this coalition is working in coalition with other uh, uh, nutrition advocates across the state um, that are doing this work. And I think that, you know, again, trying to build some of those relationships are critical. Um, to position yourself as a resource, again, you want to, to you know, really develop yourself as an authority on issues. You can develop fact sheets and policy briefs to help uh, policymakers understand the issue. Again, localizing some of that data that is relevant for their district is, is really helpful. And, um, you know, uh, if you're doing in-person visits or even if you are doing a virtual visit, um, having that, sending them that um, fact sheet and soft copy form is a great way for follow-up. Um, media advocacy has also been uh, a strategy that's been um, being used more and more to bring attention to an issue. Um, you know, people are, are, you know, we've seen a number of our um, uh, homeless advocates actually turning to, to media to say, hey, look at how dire our situation has been, you know, talk to this person that has been ignored by the system. Um, and you'll see that as a way to continue to bring light to issues. Um, and I think some of the more traditional things we have seen, you know, all of us have probably gotten an action alert, uh, action alert to sign this like change.org petition or to call your legislator um, to support this bill. Um, so, uh, or using Twitter storms. I don't know if, if, if folks are um, on Twitter, but you know, there have been campaigns to basically, um, you know, direct message policymakers on particular issues or to tweet at them um, as a way to convey a message. And so, um, on your control panel, I wanna see, uh, you know, using a yes, no button, you know, how many of you have participated in one or more of these activities? You see the yes or no button on the bottom of your control panel? Let's see. I think it's under reactions, maybe. I have this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, so we're seeing some of that, yep. Uh, how about two or more of these? Okay. Get seeing some green check marks or a thumbs up. Perfect. Three or more? Oh, okay. Great. All right. Okay. Um, uh, so a uh, second harvest also wanted me to talk a little bit about some of the nuances of working with the state legislature versus um, 
uh, a local government. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And it may feel a little bit like Schoolhouse Rocks, um, you, you know, if I'm aging myself there, <laughs> uh, Schoolhouse Rocks. So this is basically uh, the state legislative calendar. Um, and I'm not gonna get into too much, much detail because it, it is pretty convoluted. So this is basically how uh, legislation moves through the um, through the, the houses in, in Sacramento. Um, so basically right now we're at the beginning kind of of the legislative process. So in January, February timeframe, bills are introduced either in the state assembly or the state Senate. Um, most of the bills will have to go to, um, uh, we'll have to go through some vetting through the legal counsel before it's being printed. And so that's what's happening right now in Sacramento. So um, uh, uh, our state legislators are generating ideas, they're drafting language that has to go through um, some vetting. And uh, the deadline for introducing bills to be heard that year is the third week of February. So uh, if you've got a great idea for um, a potential uh, uh, bill, now is the time to, uh, if you haven't already, to um, go ahead and float that idea with your legislator. Um, the bill is then given the first reading in its house of origin. So if it's, if it's a bill that's introduced in the state assembly, um, it's given that first reading in, in, in March. In March and April, um, it tends to be a very busy time for the, the state legislature as bills are heard in their respective policy committees. So, for example, if there is a, um, a bill related to, um, uh, I don't know, social services, it's going to be heard in the, like, the Assembly Human Services or the Senate Human Services Committee um, first before it gets referred to a fiscal committee um, to assess the, the impact of so any bill that has a price tag is going to be referred to a fiscal committee. Um, in May, the fiscal committees uh, will uh, usually start hearing uh, those, those bills that have been already vetted through the policy committee, and then they'll make determinations on what bills will move forward, depending on the cost of the price tag. Um, and so they need to um, be able to, to also pass that fiscal committee. And then the last week of May, you'll hear that bills go to the floor, meaning that they are voted on by the full house. Um, process is repeated in the other house uh, in, from June to August. Um, again, so you've got, uh, so if a bill started in the state assembly, it's passed out of the assembly, uh, and then it'll go over to across the other way and go to the state senate. And then the process repeats again, basically from June to mid-August, uh, the state Senate will uh, hear those policy committee meetings. Um, the second half of August is generally uh, for consideration of uh, uh, those fiscal bills and fiscal committees. And then in September, um, you're gonna have four sessions again, where all the bills that have been um, processed will be voted on and have made it out of both the policy committee and a fiscal committee, and they'll be heard and voted for on the floor. So all bills must be out of the legislature and onto the governor's desk by the second week of September. As we know, uh, the governor has the end of September until the end of December to sign or veto um, bills. So just want to um, go through that, uh, that calendar. So I, I know that was a lot of information um, and it, there is great, um, kind of a great diagram and kind of flow chart on the state legislature's website that I would encourage um, folks to, to look at to kind of familiarize yourself with the legislative calendar. So I uh, wanted to make sure that you were um, processing that. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a closer look on some of the relevant committees, oops, sorry, uh, that you uh, be working with. There we go. All right. So. Um, Based on conversations I've had with um, the, the Second Harvest staff, these are typically, in my estimation, a lot of where the issues that you all care about as a coalition will be, um, uh, will be reviewed. Uh, so like I said, the Human Services Committee and the Education Committee in the Assembly and on the Senate side, again, uh, the Human Services Committee, um, you know, I think is, is also uh, a, a, another committee that will do some initial policy vetting um, for the issues that you care about. Um, and, but it, 
I would implore you to take a look at these committees and see who among our local um, elected delegation is on these committees. For example, uh, on the Human Services Committee, Assembly Member Mark Stone, um, who is the representative for Southern Santa Clara County, Monterey County, and Santa Cruz County, is on the Assembly Human Services Committee. And I think at one point he even chaired it, right? Uh, on the Education Committee, um, Assembly Member Alex Lee, who represents uh, North San Jose, Bill Pitas, Fremont, um, is on that committee. Uh, the budget committee has a number of subcommittees, and so I think the ones of interest to this group, again, are going to be um, budget sub one, sub, sub any budget one, which is related to um, human health and human services, and we've got a couple of folks uh, between Santa Clara and um, San Mateo counties that are on these committees. So we've got Assemblymember Alex Lee, Assemblymember um, Kevin McCarty, and um, Assemblymember Mark Stone. On the Senate side, uh, on we have... Um, our own uh, state Senator, Dave Cortezzi, who serves on the Human Services Committee. He also serves on the Budget Committee um, and um, Senator Laird, who represents Southern Santa Clara County, Monterey County, um, San Luis Obispo County and Monterey County. He actually chairs, he's, uh, he chairs the Budget and, uh, Subcommittee on Education. So we've got a, quite a few members of our local delegation um, you know, who are serving on these, these committees of interest. And so I wanna stop here and, and ask the group, what other state um, legislative committees have y'all worked with that may not be covered on this slide? So um, you can put in the chat or raise a hand, I'm not sure what would be best. Or are these kind of it? I, this for this group, this may be it. Um, but we do have a question in the chat, which I think is a great one. Uh, is there a strategy behind going to assembly or to Senate first with your issue? Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, it's been a couple of years since I've worked on a uh, state policy. Um, I think it, again, I think it's context sensitive. Um, some people uh, would argue that it's a little bit easier to get things through the assembly because you've got more assembly members um, by virtue of numbers, right? So if you've got a bill idea and you know, you've know you got 80 senators at your disposal, I mean, 80 assembly members in your disposal for the assembly, but only 40 in the, the Senate. So if we're just looking at sheer numbers, you're gonna have you know maybe a higher probability of getting um, more traction in the assembly. Um, you know, I, I don't really have uh, much insight on one versus the other. Um, but, you know, looking purely at a numbers game. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it could be, there may be, I would argue too, that the state assembly actually has more granular level committees than the, the state Senate. So there, if, you know, there, you've got a very niche issue, it may be better served um, in, uh, uh, in the assembly because they have um, a more relevant committee, whereas the, the Senate committees because of the number of senators they have, they have to have bigger jurisdiction over issues. And so, um, again, maybe in that way, uh, working with the assembly is easier. Okay. Right, so now working to with local government, I'll run through these pretty quickly because I still wanna give us time to do a little bit of Q&A and a little bit of practice. All right, so uh, working with the County of Santa Clara, which is where I am, um, Referrals are wonderful ways that supervisors is explore um, different policy ideas, they gather information, pilot initiatives, and any uh, board of supervisors meeting is an opportunity to get a referral introduced. And so, for example, on uh, next Tuesday's board of supervisors agenda, um, Supervisor uh, Chavez actually has a referral related to supporting micro businesses in our county, as well as um, kind of uh, making things a little bit easier for home kitchens and home kitchen entrepreneurs to do business in our county. Um, as because there have been, as we this group may know, there's been some recent changes at the state level to make that a little bit uh, to to uh, get rid of some of that red tape. Um, coming up a little bit uh, later um, in the spring is our budget inventory process. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the budget inventory process, this is a discretionary um, grant program that each of the five supervisors to have access to, right, to basically fund proposals that they um, want to prioritize. So every 
process looks a little bit, every board office runs their process a little bit different. Um, you know, and so it's an opportunity for, for uh, organizations to pilot new ideas, to help um, expand um, current programming. Um, and it's just a, an, an easy way to, uh, to uh, try to get some one-time funding to help support um, these, these ideas. Um, each of the supervisors serves on a, at least two board policy committees. And so um, if you're not familiar with them, uh, they are broken up by a uh, jurisdiction. So uh, the probably the ones that this group might be most and concerned about are the Children, Seniors and Families um, Committee, uh, which is a uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellerberg serve on that committee. Another one that might be of interest to this group is um, the Health and Hospital Committee, um, which Supervisor Smidian and my boss, Supervisor Lee, serve on. So if you're not familiar with the, these committees, um, again, these policy committees vet issues um, for uh, the full board, and they're a great way to provide input and to um, answer questions. Um, Study sessions or special hearings are great ways for raising awareness on issues. Um, and Supervisor Chavez and former Supervisor Cortez were great in using um, the study sessions or special hearings to highlight key issues of concern. And so um, Supervisor Chavez a couple of years ago um, did a series of uh, special hearings on sexual assaults and domestic violence. Um, Supervisor Cortez did one on um, issues affecting older adults. Um, there were uh, there was recently a special session held by the health and health and hospital committee to understand the impacts of long COVID. Um, so for those of you who are um, interested in these issues and trying to gain some traction on these issues, um, asking a board office to hold a special study session or a special hearing on these issues is a great way to, again to highlight um, the, the the concerns of, that you are championing. All right, and so for those of you who are working in a nonprofit, um, those of you who actually have active contracts with the County of Santa Clara, um, the County Executive's Office actually has this community-based initiative to help pro um, provide and facilitate communication and facilitate stronger relationships between community-based organizations and the county. Um, and so um, they, before COVID, they used to meet quarterly to talk about issues of interest and in, in how to improve processes. I'm not sure if they're still doing that um, because of COVID as a number of things have been put on hold, but I uh, just wanted to mention that for those of you who may not be familiar with that initiative. Okay, so again, lots of information I'm trying to run through. Um, for those of you that are uh, have uh, ties with the city of San Jose, um, the city of San Jose has a number of mechanisms in place that are very similar to what um, the county of Santa Clara has. Um, the budget documents are kind of the equivalent of our budget inventory items at the County of Santa Clara. Um, proposals for these budget documents, again, discretionary program of grant funding by uh, city council members is usually due in um, April, May timeframe. Um, in, and depending on the year, uh, the, the city council also has a priority setting session to identify issues uh, the council will take on during the course of the year. And so I know um, there have been a, there's been a lot of advocacy um, around these council priority setting sessions to try to gain more traction on issues of interest. Like, um, for example, Council Member Arenas, you know, has done a lot around, um, you know, uh, paid sick leave for um, families. She's done a lot of work around um, child care issues, and so she's been using the council priority session priority setting session to really make sure that this is on the radar of the city council and that city departments are actively working on this. And again, um, like the, the county of Santa Clara, the city council will often have study sessions on a number of issues, um, special hearings like we did. They've done one on equity. They've done a few on equity, uh, which was particularly powerful. And again, you know, it's a way to raise awareness for a lot of the issues uh, that you may be caring about. Okay. Um, just a couple of resources for you. Um, I believe uh, Rachel and the team will send out um, the deck in a little bit, um, and these will be live hyperlinks. But if you have, um, uh, you know, specific questions, there are a lot of great resources and FAQs on these, these um, this uh, slide here. And with that, I think we're going to uh, do a little bit of Q&A. So, Rachel, you want to cue us up? Sure. It looks like Amy, sorry, I, I know Rachel's 
got something going on right now. Um, it looks like Amy has her hand up. Do you want to start us off? Sorry, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Uh, no, I, um, I'm muted. No, I, I actually wanted to go back to a question I had asked earlier, um, which is this idea of going to a, um, a, a an elected official, like, um, and and then research and researching that elected official. I, um, I think that the. the at least in my experience, the choice of that elected, like you do a lot of research and then you figure out who would be most likely to support your initiative. And I just wanna make sure that you're, yeah, that you're not suggesting something different. Sure, so like, again, when I, you know, some of that initial research that you want to do, particularly if you're trying to find a, a bill author, a bill champion, it, it's always helpful to have a, a legislator that is actually on the, the committee that where your particular idea will be heard, right? So I would start there. Um, for example, you know, my boss, again, he serves on the health and hospital committee and the finance and government operations committee. So it, you know, if you can get um, someone on that committee to champion your issue, they can help steer it through the process and, and, and gain more, uh, gain more attention to that, that issue. So, Again, you know, that's why it's important to not only read the bios and, and kind of explore the websites of um, the, the policymakers, but also to look at the committee membership assignments and see where like, hey, and especially if you find someone who a, a local member, like if it's your, your, own, um, uh, your own representative, even more powerful if you can get those stars to align. But that sometimes that doesn't always happen, sadly. Thank you so much. Of course. Other questions have popped up in the chat. The chat window is in another um, <laughs> another screen for me, so I can't uh, readily get to it. So Zia, I don't know if you can help cue us up or Rachel. I don't see anything else in the chat that we haven't um, directly answered yet. Um, is, does anyone want to come off mute and ask a question? I have a question. This is Olivia. Um, I, I like to think about whether or not we could help clients to become advocates in some way or to, um, yeah, to have the training and, and understanding of how to advocate. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas about that, how that might work? Yeah, absolutely. I haven't run a client advocacy program, um, but yeah, I, I think um, there are lots of organizations that actually have very successful client advocacy programs i think most um particularly about community health partnership which is the consortium of uh, community health clinics um, in our county they have a very active um, patient advocacy um a program where they actually um train um the the clients on um you know particular legislative uh bills of interest and will we'll, you know take them and train them and you know and kind of give them a little bit of media training too and a little training on how to do some of these visits, like I just I, I shared with this group this afternoon, um, and they will be dispatched um, and and talk with the legislator. So it, it absolutely uh, can work. Um, it would probably have to be a little bit. Um, this training that I gave you today would probably have to be a little bit modified um, for that. But uh, you know, a lot of the same principles would ring true. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you, Olivia. Um, does anyone else have anything else I'd like to ask Wendy before we hop off into our breakout sessions? Okay, I have a question for you, Wendy. Yeah, you. Um, could you explain very briefly two-year bills? Ah, uh, two-year bill. It's a bill, a two-year bill. Two-year bill. So two-year, uh, yeah, and I probably am not the authority on this. So two-year bills um, refer to uh, legislation that is introduced in um, the state legislature. Um, some bills um, are very complex and they are going to take a lot of vetting or a lot of uh, analysis um, that needs to take place. So um, it, it can be determined, you know, on the front end, 
um, by the bill author that they're going to make it a two-year bill because they re recognize that it may be a thorny path ahead for them. <laughs> I think um, other times um, the bill will get modified or will um, just completely change during the, the policy committee and appropriations process, the fiscal committee process, such that uh, it won't get out of the, the house of origin in that first year. So it has to be extended into that second year. So that's typically what we see for, for two year bills. And so again, the, um, the state legislature has a two year legislative cycle. And so that is probably the most straightforward way I can answer your question, Rachel. So. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. Thanks. I figured since I had you on the hook, I could yeah, I could there finally you go. get that Perfect. one figured out. Um, yeah, at this my point, space policy work is about ten years old, so uh, <laughs> we're a little we're a little I'm a little bit behind. So yeah. No worries, all good. Um, at this point, I'm going to end the recording. So if you are watching this in the future, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. If you do have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll pass them off to Wendy. My name is Rachel Monaco. Again, I'm the Manager of Advocacy at Second Harvest with Silicon Valley. Um, and we will have the slide decks available along with the recording on our website.